at least uh, at least get the recording going. Didn't we have that happen before, Chris, where uh, we went through a whole episode and I didn't hit record? I think it was one where me and you were just no, talk, it was talking. Ryan. About... Maybe, but we also had Ryan where he talked for like three hours and he was like, well, let me know when you want to start the podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Like, dude, we've been, yeah, we've been recording. <laughs> That's how these are. It's It's not Channel 5 News or anything like that. So, Nathan, uh, can you give us a little bit of a background with your experience with uh, pigeons? Sure. Um, I started out when I was like really young. I think my brother and I were probably like 10, 12 years old, and uh, we wanted to, to uh, raise pigeons, and we'd found some guy that would uh, sell us some rollers, and just me and my brother would build a loft, and we had, had our birds. Uh, that that progressed to uh, you know getting some fancy breeds, some fantails, camorners, uh, trumpeters, and and such. I was also into like the the flying, uh, racing pigeons, and you know growing up we didn't we didn't have very much money, but you know a lot of a lot of desire and whatnot. And there was a gentleman that lived down the street from us that had a, a really nice loft and was had some really good quality racers, but he would only allow them to breed certain times of year and to kind of fulfill our our desire for some good birds what he did was he gave us some eggs and we just fostered them with the other ones and end up with some pretty decent racers that we just would take and we didn't actually race them we'd take them you know 50 miles away whatever and let them go and kind of just have fun with it that way so you know most most of my uh my teenage years i i had pigeons funny thing is and, and this is kind of a, a fun little side note is that I currently don't have any pigeons. I haven't had any since I was, I think I gave up my pigeons when I was about 20. So it's been 20 some odd years that I haven't owned, actually owned the pigeons. Currently I do, I do have parakeets. I got an aviary full of parakeets and I want to try and get back into some diamond doves or something that might be compatible with the parakeets. I just don't have a, a space and there's, there's some uh, restrictions in my, my neighborhood. So so I've always, I was curious about this. You know, we've had, uh, we've gotten, we got your calendar the first time last year and I'm always looking at your, these pigeons and I'm always curious, where are you, where do you get these pigeons at that are in those calendars you make? A lot of the, the, uh, the photography work, uh, I go to the pigeon shows. Uh, when I first started doing a calendar, I got so much uh, grief from, you know, certain people in the, in the pigeon fancier circles that like, oh, this isn't show quality or that one's a, a lousy really? stuff. <laughs> so, you know, all, all the hate, you know, that, that oh, comes geez. with, you just can't please everybody. But yes. I kind of like, I felt like, okay, well then what made the most sense to me was to, to go to pigeon shows. Cause you know, people are going to generally bring the best of what they've got there and then be able to, to photograph them at the shows, you know, just like, go up to the people like, Hey, I'd like to photograph your bird and, and whatnot. And I, when I first got started, um, I think people were just kind of like looking at me like, you know, are you, you know, what are you going to charge me? I'm like, I'm just trying to build up a portfolio of pigeon breeds. I mean, I've, I've always had a passion for birds and, and the pigeons and, and such. Uh, but it was just a, a matter of like, okay, how do I do this? And kind of the, the genesis of it, like when I, when I had pigeons, when I was a teenager, I'd set up and I'd do certain uh, photography things at, at home with them. And kind of the style has just kind of evolved from what I started doing then. I felt like I could I could take advantage of the shows, get a wide variety of breeds and, and be able to talk to people and, and whatnot. And when they realize that, you know, I'm not there to, you know, charge them money to take the picture of the birds and I'm happy to share, you know, a digital copy of their birds, you know, for them to promote their birds or whatever as a side thing I've, I've had a lot of people take me up on the offer to take pictures of their birds so and it's always fun it, it gets a little bit hard sometimes at the show to you know track down who the the owner is but i'll take a picture of the tag and talk to you know some of my contacts and be like who, do you know who this guy is or do you know how to how to get a hold of them and and you know get permission to take their birds out of the cages and go and take the pictures what i used to do when i when i was younger and I was taking the pictures, I just set up like some poster boards and tried to do a flash. And, you know, I, I got thinking about it when I decided to get back into it, which that's a quick story there. Um, 
I tore my meniscus. I was out, off of work for a period of time and I just sat there and I was like looking around Instagram and, and there's like, you know, thinking back on my childhood and looking at pigeons and I was looking at, at the pictures on Instagram and I was like, you know, there's a handful of people there that I felt like they, they knew what they were doing with the, you know, taking the pictures of them, you know, from a, a photographic back background. But I thought, you know, this is something I could do. And then I thought, well, what if I did a, a calendar? So that was kind of the genesis was, was just looking through Instagram and seeing, you know, what pictures were popular and, you know, what breeds and kind of doing some research that way. And then I just reached out to uh, local pigeon, the Utah Facebook pigeon group. And I, you know, I said, hey, I'm interested in taking pictures of birds. And I got zero responses the first time around. Um, and then about a month or so later, I tried it again. And that's when I, I got uh, Max Long, who does a lot of Indian fantails and west of england so i'm trying to think and he had some trumpeters he's like yeah come on over to my house so i went over to his house and that was my first official shoot with it and i i built like a, a light box or a shadow box out of pvc pipes like an old white bed sheet my mom helped me you know i was like she used to be a, a, a seamstress and i said hey this is what i want to do so she helped me you know take a convert a a bed sheet into a, a cover for this pvc skeleton that I, I i created and then i bought some uh pvc liner uh sheets and that's how i get that solid white background or the solid black background that's one of those things i was going to ask you about that because uh it's totally seamless and you don't even see like an angle or anything like that it looks super clean and i put up a little uh for my for my pigeon area where i have my show cages i got white mdf board on the top bottom and back but you can clearly see you know the corners and stuff like that so that's interesting that's a really I, and that's another thing i was curious about if you're going around the show and you say can i take a picture of your bird so that was your portable setup then how huh? that you would pull the bird out set him in there and do the photo shoot then right and then what i did was my wife bought a uh she she got me like the screen pavilion one year for father's day and i kind of looked at it and i thought well I mean, that'll be fun for some picnics, but it's actually turned out pretty. There's been a few times when I've been at the show when they've actually got like a side room that I can set my stuff up in. Oh, okay. But having having the screen pavilion, I can even set it up outdoors and just run an extension cord out to to take the pictures. And then if the birds slip out of my box for whatever reason, they're not gonna get away. I did have one mishap, and I made sure ever since then that I secure that thing. I, a gust of wind came up and uh, just blew the the screen uh, tent that I think that I had up and just the first thing I did was grab that pigeon and just like oh, okay man. I got people trust me with their you know their prized birds yeah last thing I want to do is you know be that guy that uh, you know mess things up so grab the bird and hurry and put it up and then had to come back and try and figure out how to get all my stuff back together yeah so I, I just have like this uh, screen tent that I set up and and then I, I run that in now if another technical thing about the the box the, the nice thing about the box is I can put a light above it and it kind of diffuses that light so you don't end up with like a, a lot of harsh shadows that's one of the, the things if you want to talk about like the technical end of it looking at you know what what I'd seen online and I was like I didn't like I didn't like any lines on it because I, I felt like even back when I was in high school and I did some of these pictures I'll have to share some with you later. I did the black because it was easy to, to hide the lines on the black. That was back back in the day, I was shooting with black and white film on a fully manual Minolta camera my dad would let me play around with. And it worked really good for that, but it was technically a lot harder because I had to, I didn't have the fancy, you know, light meters and stuff like that. So I had to calculate what uh, settings I had to put on that cat on that camera to get the correct exposure and and balance it so and it was it was definitely the other thing that made it really difficult is is unlike digital you know you, you pull out your phone you pull out even all, any of the cameras now you know within you know two seconds if you've got the picture you want and i was taking the pictures and i, I had to be stingy with it i'm like you look back on it now and when when i shoot and film it by the time you included the cost of the film, the developing stuff, you're between 50 cents to a dollar per print, you know, to develop it and everything else versus digital now where it's, 
shoot as many as you can, get the get the right picture and delete the rest or be a digital pack rat. Like, you know, my, my wife's like, well, don't you label everything? And I'm like, well, that'd take too much time. I just go through and I, I select the ones I want and, and work from, from there, you know, and there's, you know, I can't tell you how many hard drives and, and whatnot I've, I've filled up over the years. I treat my, my SD cards like, like I would like the old negatives. Like I don't like to write over them and whatnot because heaven forbid I have a catastrophic failure of my hard drive or whatever I, I want, you know, oh, yeah. a backup. Yeah. So I usually try to do like a triple, triple backup. You know, I, I upload it to Google Photos, save it on, on my hard drive. I got an external hard drive and I've got the SD cards that keep track of it. Hello and welcome to the All About Pigeons podcast. I'm Phil. I'm Chris. And we have with us photographer Nathan Abbott. He does all kinds of photography, plants, fish, reptiles, but also pigeons. He also has a pigeon calendar that he makes every year that's got really good variety of breeds, real high quality images. You can uh, find a lot of his stuff. You can I find a lot of your stuff just by Googling Nathan Abbott, but he also has an Instagram, Nate's Pigeon Portraits. Um, you can look at a lot of his work there. And we all love our birds. We all take tons of pictures of them. You know, when I go to the, uh, when I was just at the pigeon show that we just had the other weekend, you know, I was asking people about the birds and they whip out their phone and, you know, everyone's got like a folder of just pictures of their pigeons. So whether it's, you know, showing your friends at the show or mainly social media, you know, a lot of people, especially guys working on colors and stuff like that or rare breeds, like put pictures up there. And I know we're using a phone and, you know, you're a professional photographer using high-end equipment and stuff, but what uh what kind of tips can you give the listeners about you know get that best picture you know that you can with a phone i mean i i know right now like you were, we were saying earlier we'll take a whole bunch of pictures kind of pick the best one um like i said i had a, i built a little show pin and i put white mdf board on all three sides but it still is looking kind of weird could you kind of go back real quick and describe how you made that that frame and the, the blanket set up. I mean, that'd be kind of a cool thing to have just for throwing a bird in for a picture every now and then. Yeah. So what it is, um, I, I build a box and it's, it's about like two foot each direction out of PVC. So you got, you know, your, your corners, it comes down the, the front of it is, is not connected because I want that roll or the, that plastic that I use to do the backdrop and the, and the bottom of it to to smooth and, and not have anything interfering so I can get a lower shot without having a pull in the way. I, I use the, the white fabric so that you don't have anything that's gonna discolor the the overall shot. Uh, the other thing that, that's really helpful, like you said, you, you use the MDF, buy like PVC sheets that they're used for photography. It's, it's like a two foot by four foot. So basically it'll cover that that, you know, the back to the and the floor of that. And I use uh, just some plastic clips, you can get them at, at uh, Walmart or whatever to hold that thing in place once it's it's up. And the reason why I like the, the PVC is because I guarantee you, every time you pick up a bird and you put it in there, the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna take a dump on it. And so you need something you can wipe it up very quickly. I would say about 80, 90% of the birds, I don't know, it's just a, just a reflex or whatever, you know, they're, not going to poop on you while you're carrying them but the second they feel like they can relax they're going to let it go almost almost every time so it's like yeah i gotta have i gotta have this and it, and i like to use the, the black or the white you know you, colors are optional i know there's a really good uh other photographer who does a lot of uh, npa stuff and he does all the shows here officially you may have heard of him his name is lane gardner yeah and he does a really good job with the, the pictures and i there's kind of a i don't know if how to, how to describe it like he has his style and he's he's looking for you know wanting to have the that kind of like the breed standard you know like when if you look at the line drawings they do the breed standards that's that's basically how he executes his shots i'm looking more for personality and and some people you know like oh i i don't like that shot because it it does this and i'm like looking at it like I said, there's always going to be that that hater that doesn't, you know, oh, that's not a perfect bird or, oh, you, you should do it like, you know, like Lane does. And I'm like, well, there are two different people. We've got two different approaches. I, I look up to his stuff. He's a great guy, but it's, that's not what I'm trying to execute. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, just let it, just let it slide off your back. 
Yeah, that one you did with the uh, figurita and the Polish links is pretty cool. So I don't know if you've ever met Terry. He's out of California. He's he's always showing at the show. He wasn't there at the last show I went to. I had uh, met like surgery or whatever. He's been one of my big supporters. And that, that shot was actually his idea. I've been like really big on just doing, you know, single birds. He's like, I really want to, you know, show off the difference. Between, and those were both his birds. And he's like, I really want to show off the, uh, you know, the difference in sizes of these. In my mind, you know, like I, I totally agree with Figurita. If I could have found a runt, you know, a giant runt pigeon to take a picture of with it, to me, that would have been, you know, like the ultimate, you know, like Great Dane versus Chihuahua kind of shot right. um, for size comparison of pigeons. I mean, people don't realize that there's that much of a size difference in the pigeons. But yeah, he, he, he wanted me to do that. He brought the birds over and I'm like, okay, let's try this. And I've, I've done some experimentation with multiple birds in the, in the shots since then. And I'm like, okay, that's something I needed to do more of. Like I missed an opportunity. Like I did some Indian fantails that belonged to Max Long, a black one and a white one together. Yeah. Um, and that turned out really good too. It does create all new layers of chaos. Cause like sometimes you get a bird in there and you know, they've got a mind of their own. I'd say some of the most difficult uh, breeds to photograph are archangels. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with that breed. Yeah. Yeah. I used to have some, they're kind of wild, kind of flighty. They're, they're, they're extremely, you know, they don't, they don't want to hold still. And the other one, and I, and I think it's kind of an intelligence thing or an inquisitiveness, but oriental uh, rollers always want to just kind of work their way up to the front and where you can't take a picture of them. They're like just sitting there looking like, Hey, yeah, uh, you know, what, what are you doing? You know, or they're, there's, they're a little more inquisitive breed than, than the others. That's kind of a, a little side thing, but it, it's still kind of interesting that, you know, there are definitely some, uh, personalities in the in the genetics of, of the, the various breeds right when you're photographing these birds do you um do you use anything to get them to pose one guy he uh uses a feather on a stick i know lane uses something that looks like a like either a you know a i know he's lane was is a former music teacher so i think he uses something like a conductor's kind of stick or something to try and get him because he, he one of the things that lane you know I, I had a chance to talk to him at the last show and he was like giving me pointers on on how he takes pictures of the birds but you know one of the things I, I didn't realize was was a it, it's a very big deal to him it's not necessarily a big deal to me although I think that it does make for a sharper looking one is he's like don't let the tail feathers hit the, the ground you want them to be in the air and I'm like you know I mean obviously if it's a fantail that's gonna be something to be be aware of but he's like you know that's that's kind of his like what makes a great picture to him. one of the elements that makes a great picture to him this guy here he uses a uh, like a, a little block for them to stand on and he's, he's taking pictures of racing pigeons for one loft racing yeah i've seen guys do that yeah the block thing where they put him up on a block and take their picture that's ryan from uh ryan Zoom. yeah and he photographs those all those birds in a light in a white box yeah, I was going to say, I, I have noticed, I've kind of been thinking about my strategy and I, it works, you know, 70, 80% of the time with, with the birds I'm photographing. But I can say that one advantage to, you know, having a piece of wood or something like that, that would be better than, than the way I do it, is that there, there seems to be some breeds are, are really sensitive to the tactile, you know, like that really smooth plastic. It, it's hard to get a good Indian fantail shot and some of the muffed breeds don't know you know it's like i think that they they react to that surface like they think they're just going to slide off of it and so they'll hunker down and they you know they won't stand up straight and or if you wanted to control where the bird is going to stand i mean they're going to obviously feel more comfortable on a piece of wood than this unnatural plastic so if you're so, just yeah. in your loft with your birds and your cell phone so they're going to be on a perch they're going to be and, and also light is kind of a weird thing too. What are some pointers you can give the listeners for that when they're just in their loft trying to get a good picture? Well, there's there's several things that I would say if you're in the loft and you just want good pictures, make sure you, uh, you know, put them in a place with no distracting uh, elements in the background. Make sure, you know, like if you got like a perch or something that you can have like a solid, you know, non-distracting background is probably the biggest thing. Always make sure that the bird is looking at you you know, or, or that you, you have a 
uh, full view of, of at least one of the eyes is you know you're not getting like this a weird look i'm that's i'm really big on making sure no matter what position they're in or whatever that anything i put out you know with, with rare exception i i want, want to see the eye because i feel like that that's what gives my my pictures like the personality is, is just that eye and sometimes you know you catch a mid blink or whatever as far as the lighting a lot of cell phones are really good at compensating for the light and adjusting you know if you've got like artificial light in there sometimes it'll read that as like a yellowish light you know if it's an incandescent or or whatever so you you'll need to go into your camera settings and you a lot of times it'll allow you to adjust for different types of light even in the cell phones uh, you just have to to know how to know where to look in your your phone to adjust that light but the biggest thing i'd say is just making sure you you get as close as you can to get as much of the bird in in there and and eliminate anything that's distracting in the background unless you you know you, I've, I've seen there's there's some people that you know they've got really fancy gardens and they let their birds out and i'm just like that would be a dream right there that you know have a, have a yard and, and be able to add you know things in the background that enhance it and not just distract from it my least favorite thing in any photo is wire oh yeah 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 the lot of the you know there's there's a lot of people that if you've got wood it it looks good but yeah wire wire never you know gives you that you know warm fuzzy feeling does it yeah, and even when we're at like shows trying to take a picture, I'll try to put the camera really close to the cage so the wires are on each side of the lens, but still, you know, you got wire all over the background and yeah, it's a show cage. I, I personally use a, a product called ACDC, but there's, I think even Canva, there's, there's like some photo editing or, or whatever uh, programs you can use. The AI is getting really good at just being able to cut that background out. And, and clean it up and that's you know like when i'm editing the pictures sometimes some more poop happens in between the shot and i can i can photo edit that out i don't feel like that's being disingenuous but i try to you know cut that work time down as much as i possibly can by just making sure i get the best shot get it as perfect as i can beforehand i even tried setting up a little area in my uh, my one breeder loft where it's just it's got a white panel in the background and it's you know, I'm like, I'll just use this area to, to put a bird for a second before they hop and fly away and try to get their picture. But that area, it's in my breeder loft, so it's got poop all over it, you know, immediately. Yeah. And uh, I, I was like, I want to put a, like a little piece of paint of green, do a green screen, and then start taking pictures of my birds with some crazy backgrounds. But it never, it never happened because it just sits in my breeder loft and it gets covered really fast. I was going to mention, you know, when I started doing the calendars the first year plus, I had a uh, an N entry level digital SLR, a Nikon one, and I've been looking like my nephew and my niece wanted, you know, cameras, and so my my sister came to me. And she's like, well, you know what, what should I get them? And I was able to find these the lens and the camera, you know, together for under two hundred dollars. So it's not you don't need super fancy stuff. I was going to mention one thing about the lighting. I started out using flash but without having a big, expensive uh, plug-in type flash system. The, ch the, the time that it takes for a flash to charge up between shots was something I didn't like to deal with because I want to take a bunch of pictures really quickly. And so that flash doesn't charge up very quickly. And so I, I, I just went for LED lights. The one problem I had with the LED light, I bought like a, a 100 watt equivalent floodlight on Amazon, it was like 20 bucks or whatever. But I found that like once I got over one hundredth of a second on my shutter speed, I'd start to get these black or like grayer uh, bands in my picture. And I, you know, I have a, a nephew that's really into the technical end of it. And I was like, why is it doing that? He's like, well, because it's an AC LED and it'll like leave literal bars in your picture just because how the, that camera is seeing that light, you know? I don't know if you've ever been outside under LED lights and it's snowing, but it, the snowflakes fall differently than they, you know, it would if you other, otherwise because of that AC power supply on it. So I switched it. He, he got me some uh, DC LED lights they've currently been using. And, and so I don't have whatever shutter speed I want. 
it doesn't really have to be that expensive of a, a setup. You can get and and the here's the ironic thing was the uh, the lens that I ended up my current favorite lens is an old film lens uh, from a Nikon film camera, and I married that to a, uh, a professional level but older uh, Nikon camera that you could you could buy this camera body for about a hundred dollars. So $100 for the camera body and then $35 for this old film lens that was like an off-brand one, but still made in Japan. So it's got really good optics on it. And that's kind of been my go-to because I need to be able to get close enough to the birds. I, I tried to buy a, a, a nicer Nikon branded uh, lens that I thought was going to up my game, but it wouldn't allow me to, to focus close enough to get the birds, you know, from where, where the way my setup was. And so I'm like, okay, so this $35 lens and a, hundred dollar camera body is is what i'm using i got a camera that i i can take better pictures with my iphone but it's um it's got all the the goodies but i never had any luck with <laughs> the nikon as well what year or what uh, model is it oh i have to look here in the bank and yeah, we have a uh, a member of our club who does photography and he came out to the show we had at our place and he took some pretty oh, cool pictures cool. of the birds flying in the air. And that, those came out really cool. I still have it on the background of my phone. The D3400. Okay. So the, the the original one that I started doing it was the, the, the 3000. So that, yours is like two or three uh, generations after that one, uh, the entry level one. So yours would do like video and stuff like that. Currently I'm using a D300 and a D600. The 300, the advantage to that one, even though you can get them cheaper, is it's a pro level one. So Nikon made it so you could use these old lenses so you can buy, you know, secondhand lenses for film cameras that nobody's using anymore. That's how I was able to get that, that lens for 35 bucks. Right. Yeah, you can get the uh, the Nikkor lenses. The only thing that I had trouble with was the, um, like, a, any auto uh, focus. Mm -hmm. That never worked. A lot of those cameras, they, with the Nikon ones, I've got them stripped down so that I take it down to one focal point. And I always make sure that I'm using that focus point where the eye is. So that I always get that okay. eye as crisp as possible. Because a lot of them will do like a, like a general uh, focus where they'll do multi-point or whatever. But I, I take a look at the picture or the, you know, kind of how that pigeons want to, to pose. And I, I dial it, you know, I, you can use it. It's got like a little cursor button on the thing. So you can change it so that focus is, is in that area where I want the eye to be in focus. And it's always better to just be closer, which is kind of hard with pigeons, than it is to take a picture and zoom in on it. For, if you want to get like, you know, feather details and stuff like that, yeah. yeah. The, other, the other point that I would make is... It, like you were talking about the uh, photographer that, that was doing the flying pictures. And I've done a, a few times where I've done flying pictures. I think last year was the, I, I put in a, a flying picture of a, like a Damascene pigeon. And the, the main thing with that is, is making sure you've got a, a shutter speed that will stop the, the wing action. So you need to do something in like the one two thousandth of a second range or, or, or higher. And that kind of can become a little more difficult if, you're, if your light isn't strong enough. Um, but usually if you're you're shooting in midday, you can make that happen. You may have to change other settings on there to to change your ISO. And I don't know if you're you're familiar with ISO. ISO is just basically a, uh, a measure of light sensitivity. So you want your ISO on whatever camera you're using as low as possible. Most of the time I'm shooting in the, the 200 ISO range just so that you can get as much detail and and everything else and and when i'm editing those pictures i usually will shoot what they call raw which is an uncompressed format so that you can make adjustments later most of your uh, your cameras that they have on the phones and stuff like that i don't know of any of those that will shoot in raw um, but it's usually not necessary yeah they definitely have a, just so many settings now for cameras and all the different settings you can do with your phone i mean you can do, you can do pretty good pictures you got to kind of learn your phone a little bit but yeah the other side of it would just be like some of the stuff you're talking about moving that point so it's focused on the eye getting as close as you can keeping the lighting good i remember we did a uh, 
a, a photo shoot down in Tucson and the guy who kept saying, you know, I want everyone to face the sun. And we're, so we're all just like squinting and our eyes are watering and stuff. And all right, just uh, keep your eyes closed. I'll count to three, then open your eyes and we'll take a picture. And I mean, I'm sure the lighting was good, dude, but all of our faces just looked absolutely ridiculous. You know, we're all about like tears, just staring yeah. into the sun, trying to, you know, he, but he's trying to use that natural light, I guess. And <laughs> It was, it was right. Yeah, I, I I tell you, it's like I get asked all the time, uh, you know, my family members to do like family pictures and stuff, and I was just like, okay. I will do it most of the time. But there's some like I don't want my my niece wanted me to do her wedding, and I was like, I really don't want to do that because it's a lot of pressure. I mean, like a pigeon's not gonna say, why'd you make me look fat, you know? Or I don't know, you got those fanciers you, upset you know, you at you for not getting the best best pigeons. Sometimes you get pictures like I I see comments, you know, sometimes online where it's like. Why'd you pick that? That's not a, a good bird. And I'm just like, you know, I, there's times when I want to just get on there and say like, you know, why, I, I don't see any pictures that you've posted, you know? Right. Hey, just go um, take some pictures of some ferals, man. That'll, that'll get them quiet. You know, that that's the funny thing with the uh, the Facebook page. I asked my followers, you know, like what they want to see more of. And, and a lot of them are, they, they want to see more ferals. So yeah. <laughs> who knows? I say, you know, there's there's part of me that you know, every day when I drive to work, there's like this overpass and there's always tons of birds underneath there. And I thought, you know, I'll just go there during one of my lunch breaks, and just totally unwind, you know, yeah, taking pictures of ferals. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, like what and italy and stuff like that where they got like you know hundreds of pigeons in the square and stuff those are always real popular pictures yeah they're all um, and then you know the, the interesting uh, part of my my interest in the uh in the pigeon space is kind of like that whole what you know what they've been able to do as far as breeding them and all the variety and stuff like that you know like yeah. a a, a very interesting thing. I've, I've thought about doing goldfish the same way, just because there's so much variety and, and things that they've done in the breeding. Have uh, you ever thought about doing, um, I've even seen snap on ones that go on your phone for eye sign, where they'll put a snap on magnifier on your camera lens for your phone and you can get like this incredible zoomed in picture of the pigeon's eye and just see all the depth that's in there. You ever seen those pictures? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen those, and I and I've done some research on that, and it's kind of interesting, you know. Like, there's there's definitely enough people that believe in the eye sign to the to the point that, you know, they will pay a certain dollar amount for ones that have eyes that look certain. And I had no idea, but I guess there's there's something to it where they like they can look at it and they can say, oh, this one's going to be a good long distance or short distance or, right, yeah, you know. And- we're, we're going to be doing an interview with uh, David Ottaway, who's like an eye sign expert, and he's going to lay it out for us. But you see that with, they'll take a picture of the racing pigeon, and then, you know, in that picture in the corner somewhere will be a picture of their eye. You yeah. Know, that's a part people really do look at. Yeah, it's especially. I mean, it uh, that can be as important to some of those the, the serious racers as the, like the, uh, the actual genetics. Some of those are really, you know, they're really beautiful. The colors and yeah, everything else. Yeah, I got else. a new one. Um... I got a new eyepiece for looking at that stuff. I'm gonna look at it like a jeweler, baby. Monopoly man. Yep. <laughs> Little monocle. Yeah, I got one, man. The old man gave it to me last time I was out to see him. Really? Is that what he used it for? Uh, yeah, he's he's into that. That's, he thinks that's where it's at. Yeah, a lot of people do for a long time. I mean, that's the side of it. So yeah, we're gonna be talking with him on the next one, but. We're up against the clock on this so i want to thank you nathan for coming on this yeah. has been pretty cool i really want to see all these listeners posting just next level pictures of their pigeons all over the social media and everything else and uh, you can always check out nathan's got an instagram so that instagram is at nate's pigeon portraits and we're going to post his links we got some of his links posted right now on our facebook we'll post the other links for his calendar too which i love your calendar man it's always fun every month i don't uh when I first get the calendar, I flip it over, I look at all the breeds, and then after that, I don't look at it again, so that way I'm kind of surprised every month to, to see what's coming up around the bend. So really enjoy the calendars, man. Keep that work up. And um, um, Just so you, just so you know, right now, I, I did uh, put them on the Etsy store for 30% off to okay. try and uh, clean up the current stock on that. Yeah, well, this is the um, time of the year, first of the year. or so left. Okay. Well, get on them, then. <laughs> How much is the calendar? Uh, they're thirty percent off, so I think it ends up being, and the shipping's included. It'd be about fifteen. But if you uh, want to reach out to me directly, if I don't have to go through Etsy, I can give you a better deal. So, just look up if anybody wants to look up the email address and and whatnot. I, I could probably get them sent out for about twelve bucks. 
if you go directly oh, to me. Look at that, a buck a month. A dollar a month. You got a subscription. And I've, I've got a limited supply on them, but you know, that's, that's where it's at. The other thing is if you have any questions, technical or whatever, just feel free to, you know, if give, put my email address on there and I'll try and answer those as quick as I can. Yeah, we'll definitely do that. We'll share that with everybody and they can reach out to you. That'd be great. Very cool. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Yep. Have a good one.